Hello, I'm Dan Sujic, um, director of the Design Museum, and this is Yves Behar, who certainly needs no introduction. Um, I think I first really got to know Yves' work um, in the first year of the Design Museum's Designs of the Year uh, Award, um, which was won by a project Eve was very involved with, um, the one laptop per child. And since there is a bit of a theme today about color, we thought we might start with why was the one laptop per child uh, that particular shade of lime green? Well, we, um, so the one laptop per child, when, when we got the incredible award, the, the um, you know, it was really a big moment. We were at the, somewhat at the beginning of the program, and um, I continued to work on it, um, you know, for like seven years after that. Um, but the color, the color of the one laptop per child were, is something that we, we explored for probably a year and a half between Nicolas Negroponte, the initiator of the One Laptop Per Child initiative, and myself. Um, it was very, we were trying to find a color that didn't make the product feel like a toy, and that would, but that also was sort of friendly and attractive and unique. Um, and we actually looked at, this is, this is a very small array, of colors, but there was a lot of discussion about what the screen color should be, white or, um, or, 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 or uh, duotone with the rest, or black. Um, but we looked at, at colors for a very long time. And as, as, it, as it often is the case with color, um, it happens usually at the end of a project, and it's absolutely strategic, which is, um, that's in conflict, right? Something that happens in the end, and yet is strategic. But we ended up uh, show, picking up the green. And the green is a unique color in the world of computing. Nobody had used it. And I think the green helped, contributed to the fact that the laptop became an instant icon that people would recognize anywhere in the world. People know what the one laptop per child looks like. And yet, very few people have seen one because they're not intended. Very few people out here have seen one because they were not intended for the developed world. How successful was the project? I mean, the color is a key part of it, but really it was about another story. It was taking computing to those who can't afford it. So the, the, the program was uh, successful, I believe, in two ways. Um, first, it was successful in creating a completely new notion that computers and technology is relevant in education in places like the developing world. Um, at the time when we presented the concept, all the big guys, all the big uh, computing companies basically said, no, people want bigger hard drives, they want bigger screens, they want um, a, a bigger graphics card, and they want a, a CD or a DVD drive. And what Nicholas um, proposed is something entirely different. A computer that is pared down, low end, that uses very little energy, and that is um, adapted to the needs, uh, specific needs of, of uh, children in, in, in an education system. So we were, even though everybody was kind of against us in that, in that uh, aim, the program was successful as far as communicating in a big way that this is, this is a, this is a, a new way. And if you look today, um, Dell and Microsoft and Intel and um, all these companies are selling millions of computers adapted to the developing world. We, we have three million of them in the hands of children around the world. We are on the stamps of Uruguay. We are on the banknotes of Rwanda. But I wouldn't say that you know, we achieved the goal, the initial goal, which was 100 million laptops, 101 laptop per child, laptops in the hands of children. But what happened is the ultimate aim was simply that 100 million laptops be out there in education systems, which, um, which actually happened. It happens to not always be ours. How did you um, find yourself in a position to work on that project? Um, so Nicholas uh, Nicoponte um, is really a, a, a prophet of technology 
you know, in, um, in many ways. He's the founder of the MIT Media Lab, which I think in about three weeks will be the 30 years of the, of the Media Lab, the 30th anniversary of the Media Lab, which he founded. Um, you know, and he was, he, while, you know, his passion is technology, uh, while his passion is um, uh, education, design is sort of his, um, his uh, sort of hidden, you know, secret place. And he realized very early on that unless, um, unless these were designed for the children specifically, ergonomically, technically, um, but also unless the kids really loved them, loved these laptops, and they could be separated and differentiated from standard business laptops, the program wasn't going to reach its aim. And he was right about that. And um, he showed up one day in my office, and I thought initially what he talked about was a whole bunch of nonsense. Um, he talked about a laptop that costs $100, a laptop that could be sealed from the elements, a laptop that could have its own mesh network. I mean, there were incredible dreams, and um, he was contagious, and we just had to go with it. I had to say yes. I wasn't sure it was going to work. And we spent the next two years, two and a half years together, circling the world, meeting with world leaders while designing the program and having it built eventually in uh, China. And you made that decision to move from Europe to California. When, when did you go and why? Um, so I'm, I'm from Switzerland and I, um, I studied design half in Europe and half in the United States. And I'm gonna, oh, this is a little interruption. We're gonna talk, oh, I'm gonna talk about this. So um, I moved to California in the mid 90s, to San Francisco in the mid 90s. And I describe myself uh, in a flip way, which is I'm an economic refugee from Switzerland. Um, the reason is the kind of design I was interested in was about innovation, about creation of um, new categories of products, um, about you know breakthroughs. And to be honest, that doesn't happen very much in Switzerland. Um, so. Uh, so, and at least not at the time. And um, when I moved to California, to San Francisco and the Bay Area specifically, uh, there, was, there wasn't much design there. It was a bit of a desert when it comes to design. There weren't a lot of good examples of design there. But there was the promise of technology entering our everyday lives. And there was a real need for design to address what these new tools were going to be, what, how we were going to use them, how, were they, how they were going to fit in our lives. By that stage, of course, there was already the um, Silicon Valley was in place. It's not quite what it is now, but there was that um, cluster of businesses around Stanford University. Yeah. The D school was going by then? No. No, no D school was later. Um, the only example as designers that we, you know, that we, that we were tempted to use was Apple. Apple was, you know, had some, some ups and some downs, a lot of downs. But you couldn't use Apple as an example in a business meeting because Apple was seen as an utter failure. Um, Apple was, you know, if you compared it to Microsoft, people would kind of laugh it off from a business standpoint. Nobody wanted to be like Apple back then. But there was, for me, there was a real promise of combining ideas of sort of humanity, how we were going to live, what, what, you know, what was going to, how technology was going to become, you know, part of our everyday lives. And, it, you know, that happened slowly. But, for example, in 1999, and, you know, the, the sort of width of my genes kind of dates that, um, dates that year there, but in 1999 we were invited by Aaron Betsky to rethink about the shoe. And we created a shoe called the Learning Shoe, and you know, that, that is now 16 years ago, but the Learning Shoe was um, essentially collecting data about how you walk, about your pronation, about your change of weight. But the reason to do this wasn't a technological one. It was because I felt like the relationship between a shoemaker and their customers was, was very, 
you know, volatile. I mean, uh, you know, you wear the shoes for a season and then you pick another brand and there's no learning there. And I thought, I thought manufacturers and companies should learn about their customers and eventually create a product that is better for me individually as, um, um, you know, as a, as a, uh, you know, customize the fit, not just the colors. And so the learning shoes idea is really not about technology. There's no Bluetooth then. There's no Wi-Fi. Um, you know, there's no way for this, you know, product to work right away. But the idea was to change the relationship between manufacturer and between um, uh, maker. And so, you know, that's I, that's why I, I I was in California is because there was a permission to think about ideas, um, to brainstorm about them, to propose things that maybe weren't ready yet technologically, um, but to, to um, you know, to, to get, to, to, to exchange ideas, to be, to be sort of on the road to somewhere. You quite quickly went away from the conventional design consultant client relationship. You started doing your own projects. I mean, uh, how did that work? So the, the um, <clears throat> what, I, what I found out is what I liked was this kind of adventure, this kind of exploration. Um, and and it's, it's hard to do with small companies. Simply, they don't have the budget. Uh, at the same time, small companies need the you know, need to compete. They need first class design. They need to differentiate themselves. They need to do things more efficiently and smarter than others, smarter than the big companies. And so, I, I, you know, the goal to establish the notion of venture design, which is a partnership model, um, wasn't initially about money. It was about creating the best possible work. And in a European sense, the best possible work is partnership work. When you look at you know, the work of Charles and Ray Eames or George Nelson with Herman Miller, when you look at the work of Richard Sapper with IBM, when you look at, you know, the best design work in the history of design is done not for one season or one product, but is you, you are part of their evolution, you're part of uh, their progression. And so how do you do that? How, can, how do you stay on but without uh, purely a consulting of uh, a, a design for fee mentality. And what we, what we developed is the venture model, which means that we become partners. For example, Jawbone has been a partner for 14 years. Um, and as the company succeeds, um, we succeed and we have the same incentives as, um, as the founders of the company. Later, I became even a founder in some, of, um, some, some um, companies that we'll maybe talk about. One of the things that happens is that these things are speeding up faster and faster. Product cycles yeah. change more and more quickly. Um, but you also have a very um, sustainable responsibility agenda in, in your work. Are those two intention? Intention? No, not intention. Are they, is there a uh, contradiction between those two? Um, I don't think so. So. You know, whether I work with Herman Miller on the latest chair, like the sale chair, um, or whether, you know, we work on the clever little bag, which is a Puma shoebox, um, or whether we work in the developing world with entrepreneurs there, um, you know, to me, the, the, um, the responsibility and the goal of design is to constantly improve on what was there before. So whether it is, um, you know, creating a table that is, or a chair that is made more efficiently than the previous uh, generation, um, you know, that is extremely important. We, you know, we, our population is growing. We need to pay, put more people in chairs. And if we produce the same, you know, following the same kind of technology, you know, such as foams and, um, you know, outgassing and, and sort of the kind of chemicals that are, that are bad, we actually you know, are doing a worse job. So we need to pe put people in better chairs, in more efficient chairs. Um, so the notion that, um, you know, doing design for good in Africa or doing um, design for sustainability is any different 
from doing design overall um, is not something that, that, um, that I believe in. One of the things that has happened since you've been in California is uh, what I sometimes call the, um, the age of digital mass extinctions. So that the thing we carry in our pockets, which is made in China, designed down the road from your studio, has killed off cameras, it's killed off music systems, it's killed off GPSs, it's, it's killed off, it's killed off, and yet we seem to hanker for stuff as well. And there seems to be a kind of interesting category of the things that have survived this, and some new categories have popped up. So the Bluetooth speaker, perhaps, is a category that's arrived. Right. And right. Well, I think there's certainly, you know, what's what we call, you know, creative destruction. So there are some things that are created, and there's some things that are destroyed. Um, you know, I think there is a fear in general. There's a fear of technology. Technology can threaten us. Um, but so can design. Design has always been about change. Design has always been about um, industrial change, production change, job change, social change. Design has always um, done something very similar that, than technology does. The difference between technology and design is that technology is about features, it's about speed, it's about performance. Um, design is about the human experience and the human experience is what you know we are you know we are focused on so when we design a, a portable speaker and I get letters um, I get people you know telling me their stories about how you know they they had music when they delivered a baby and that's something that they couldn't have in the hospital before when um, you know people tell me they proposed on a beach and there was music there, they're, you know, they're, they're the couple's favorite track. Um, in a way, it took music out of simply earbuds, which everybody was was um, was sticking in their ears, and kind of put it back in the public a little bit. And so you you know, I think the pro the, the products that are successful are the ones that change the human experience a little bit. And I I, I want to continue to try to do it in a positive way, um, or get us on the way to the next big thing. For example, trackers, which, you know, we were the first with Jabon to put uh, uh, sleep and fitness tracking on the wrist. If I think about the future of health and healthcare, trackers, the ability to know what's going on throughout the year in my health is something that is going to change healthcare, no doubt, because currently, a doctor has 15 minutes per year per patient. That's all they have for me, 15 minutes. But this collects data about my resting heart rate, uh, about my lifestyle on a 24-7 basis. Now, we're in the 1.0 of these devices. We have to start somewhere. We have to start with something that hopefully is wearable and fits you, know, fits you and you can comfortably wear all day. But five, ten years from now, it, it will be extraordinary how much we will know about our health and how much we'll be able to do in a preventative matter um, rather than ending, ending up um, you know, in, the, in the hospital. It, it's taken a while, but um, disruption has marched its way through entertainment, through journalism. It's heading for doctors now. But, um... Yes, and those are hard places to crack. I mean, if any, if any area of our economy or our life um, needs a good redesign. It's certainly the, the healthcare system. What are we looking at here? So here, this is, this is a way for me to say that, you know, um, when designing devices, I'm, um, I'm, a I'm a very strong believer in the invisible interface, meaning things shouldn't take over our lives. Things shouldn't take over our wrists either. So this is the latest um, job on that we launched, which is very discreet. You can it looks like um, another one of my hippie bands here on my wrist, um, or you can mix it with your favorite watch. The goal is for technology not to take over, not to constantly distract you and take you away from the um, from the moment. And that's certainly a tension that exists today that we all um, are struggling with. Uh, but rather, technology should be discreet and uh, should fit in our lives in a way that um, gives us the control and the information 
but doesn't take us away from it. That, that's certainly true of the lock system, which you've launched up last year. Last year was that? Your, your yes, so I... Um, Here it is. is. This is perfect. Um, I co-founded uh, August Smart Lock about two and a half years ago, and it launched a year ago. And for the last 12 months, I have not done this in the morning. I haven't looked in my bag. I haven't looked around the house about where my keys are. I haven't had keys in a year. And this is exactly the role that technology should have. Rather than adding complexity or adding friction in our lives, it should take it away. I'm, it's, it's taken away that little part of my brain that worries about where my keys are. Um, and um, that's uh, how I believe that technology should ent enter our lives in this, um, in this invisible fashion. Um, and then the signals that these products um, we design give are very discreet. When I, when I arrive towards my door, this is on the inside of the door, so there's nothing visible at all. When I arrive by my door, it opens autom automatically. I don't have to touch my phone, I don't have to open it, I don't have to unlock it. It just unlocks. Um, on the inside, the signal is just very discreet. It's just an LED that disappears, that's micro perfed on the metal. Um, more and more, I'm trying to uh, make sure that technology lives with us in a way that um, it provides us with that service. Um, this is a robot, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's not one of those Hollywood robots that are threatening the human spe species. It's just a robot that, that you know, makes it a bit magical and, and makes you forget about it. And you can retrofit it. This is a retrofit, yeah. So you don't have to change your whole door. You don't have to change your handle. Um, it just, uh, it's an add-on to the inside of your door. And you, the security is there, isn't it? You, you, you've done, you've gone a lot, done a lot of work that way. So there are, our, uh, one, of the, um, one of our partners um, is, uh, was a security, uh, digital security expert for eight years at, at Bank of America. So anytime you deal with somebody's door, um, you have to take that extremely seriously and we're, you know, it's, um, it's a part of what we think and how we think about things every day. You know, um, there, is, um, there is a level of anxiety when you change something. That said, um, when I tell people how easy it is to duplicate keys, there are apps online now where I can take a picture of your key that's just sitting there and tomorrow I'll, I'll get a copy. Um, um, you know, the, the, this is actually a, a lot safer uh, if you think of in terms of uh, safety, yeah. And I remember you were saying that this could be an Airbnb application that you actually send the codes to people without ever seeing them. It is, it is already. It's very popular with Airbnb hosts. The main pain point in the, um, you know, with Airbnb is the exchange of keys, having to go someplace, having to have somebody give you physical keys. In fact, I, I wish... I wish my hotels were outfitted with, with things like this. Um, you know, there's no particular um, payoff or no particular pleasure in waiting for your key at the front desk. And I mean, of course, the hacking is a kind of interesting subject. Um, yes. I, I was having a conversation with someone a couple of days ago about um, <clears throat> potential problems with self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Imagine being hacked into when you're being sent yeah. down the motorway in your Google car. And, it's, uh, it's already been done. Someone takes charge of it. Yeah. We're not letting you out until you've actually transferred money into an account. And so so there, uh, there are, for every new technology that we bring, there is um, just as many ways that the product is uh, used in nefarious um, uh, ways as it is in, in good ways. And, and the reason why we're you know what we what we are doing is we are learning about how to prevent these things or make them better or make them hard or impossible to hack or have countermeasures to them um you know it is the day you 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 buy a house you're worried about about people breaking into it um just like the day you enter a self-driving car you're afraid of an accident happening i think over time um, we resolve these issues in, in several ways. We resolve these issues because with laws and with uh, systems, and uh, we are a pretty good self-regulating species, I would say, right? As technology, as industry has changed over the last 
hundred years, um, our laws, our uh, expectations have also transformed. Um, and I think the same is, is happening with technology. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take them seriously. We absolutely should. But I, uh, what I guess what I'm saying is part of the process of evolution of these, of these technologies. The skills you learn when you were a student of design have got you this far, but I mean, are you, I mean, in some ways, you're a pre-digital designer who's become part of the digital waves. Yeah, there were no computers. There were no computers when I um, when I started design school, um, and and the computers, for me, technology is not. Um, it's just a tool. I the way I define technology is as a child. I love to sew. I love to make clothes for my uh, teddy bears, etc. And I remember going to the, to the, you know, later on, I remember going to the fabric store and you would pick, uh, you know, you would pick the right weave, the right fabric, the right color, the right material, the right performance. And then you would cut it into, you cut it into what you want it to be. And this is what technology is. Technology is like fabric. Technology is something that designers can mold, can cut, can shape into what it is that they want it to be. Especially today, uh, because technology today is much more, um, much easier to build, you know, software, hardware, firmware. It's never easy. It's always very hard. But, but a lot, but al almost, you know, anyone with an idea can go ahead and do that. And what makes the difference between great clothes um, that people wear and some that people don't wear, it's how it's been designed. So today, when we when we say we're afraid of, you know, afraid of change or afraid of technology, um, you know, it's it's because it's it's badly put together. And our role and our responsibility is to actually take the lead of that material, of that uh, potential, of that raw potential, and turn it into great things. I mean, there are sometimes unexpected side effects. I mean, I always think about. Um, Instagram, which was sold for a billion dollars when it had 18 employees. Yeah. Kodak had 80,000 middle-class engineering right. jobs once. Right. You know, there are, you know, and I mean, uh, self-driving vehicles are going to spell the end for delivery drivers. It's, right. What are we all going to do? Those of us who are not inside the um, the Silicon Valley bubble. Well, there are, and, and as I said, there is a, there is a sort of creation does come with destruction, um, and there are some things that um, that um, that change. But I do believe that overall, um, we are better off after the industrial revolution than before. Um, um, you know, our lifestyle and our um, our <coughs> um, employment and labor laws were actually improved by these changes. And while these changes are happening, there are certainly things that are either disturbing or unacceptable or shifts in, as I said, the economy or the social fabric. Um, you know, that, to me, that doesn't mean that things will get worse. Um, I, I don't have um, a dystopian view of the future. I think, I think Hollywood does, which is great for movie sales. But um, and and it's we actually should be we should absolutely be vigilant, but at the same time I do think um, that a lot of the technologies in place are you know very enabling. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about Airbnb and the disruption that Airbnb creates, but let's not forget that Airbnb is a source of revenue and was a, is an important source of revenue for people during the um, the downturn and uh, people who basically would have lost their housing if it wasn't for the ability to make a little extra money, make ends meet. Um, and so there's, there's two sides of those stories um, all the time. There are two Californias, aren't there? Hot, uh, maybe uh, Los Angeles is the dystopian one, and San Francisco is the optimistic one? Well, the economy of Los Angeles is, is movie making, and dystopian movies are um, very popular, and, and we love to see the destruction of our own world. <laughs> It's a, it's an entertainment uh, entertaining um, moment, and it's true that Silicon Valley has a utopian view of things, but there is also a lot of self-regulatory 
um, uh, energy there. I, on, on, you know, designers certainly um, are, are one of them, but laws are another. Uh, consumer pushback is another. Um, but I think overall, you know, we, we all can say that, um, you know, if I have to search for some piece of knowledge today, um, you know, I'm going to Google it. I don't think we can go back. No. It is, I mean, Los Angeles produced Charles Eames. San Francisco didn't. It's, um... Well, San, you know, San Francisco, I'm sure if Charles Eames was around today, he would actually have moved to San Francisco and Silicon Valley uh, because it is the fabric of, of our work. I mean, I want to uh, briefly touch upon a project, which um, um, this is, this is SodaStream, uh, uh, you know, who also is making a robot that's um, a robot that allows you to mix your alcoholic drinks. And this is something that's launching in, um, in a few months. But it's, um, first of all, you were never able to carbonate your, your, your drinks. But this is fun, it's education. I don't know how to make cocktails and this machine will uh, teach me how to. But we'll also make it possible. But um, this is another British company, British Gas, launching the Hive thermostat, which has an invisible display, so the display only comes on when, um, when you need it. The rest of the time, it reflects the environment. But the project I wanted to talk about is this, in relationship to Charles Eames. <clears throat> I'm, I have Charles Eames furniture, and if I could say, um, you know, my, my Charles Eames table, he made it for me a little, you know, one foot longer because it fit better in my living room. That would be an extraordinary thing. And when we think about virtual reality and augmented reality, um, you know, I think the, the attractiveness of putting goggles on your head or a helmet on your head to experience something um, is, is, is not, not very high for me. That said, augmented reality is going to be a part of everything we do. It's already a part of the way surgeons learn how to do surgery. Um, it's already a part of many places in education. Um, the ability to be in the world while, while seeing the result of your uh, creation or of your learning is really interesting. So what about if, you know, Charles Eames, we talked to, you know, you brought it up, you know, spent a lot of time developing a new technology, bent plywood, which displaced the need to carve wood, displaced on some level uh, the, 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 the hard work, hard working carving, you know, portion of uh, furniture making. But, um, you know, he, all of his work was about to make it comfortable, extremely comfortable. The notion of comfort in chairs came out of being able to bend it and curve it uh, into these shapes. Um, and then chairs started to adapt to people by, you know, task chairs, you can go up and down, you can sometimes get them in different sizes, you can adjust the arms. Um, augmented reality with this company, Tilco, that's launching here, it's, they're based in Warsaw. There's a lot of innovation coming from other places now than Silicon Valley. Um, allows you to essentially uh, take a design language, take a, um, Let's say, let's start with a table, but they also make other things like shelving. Um, and turn this little table into a very large dining table. Um, you can decide what detailing you like on the legs based on certain parameters, based on certain, uh, what's, you know, parametric design. Um, you can choose to change the angle of the leg if it's more of a dining table or a work table. The construction and the personality stays the same. But the, um, the look can be transformed slightly. Every designer wants their designs to adapt to as many possibilities as possible. We always ask the manufacturers to do five or six or maybe 10, if we're lucky, different versions of our products. But it's extremely costly and difficult for them to do so. They have to make it, and then it sits on a shelf until somebody orders it. Here. Not only you're designing in this uh, uh, augmented, you know, in this parametric model, augmented reality also allows you to see it in context. So you can, you know, does that table really look right with those colors, with the scale of the rest of my furniture, etc. So you're able to, um, your the price point also changes automatically at the top right there. Um, you're able to really 
create a bridge between technology and craftsmanship, between authorship, the notion of authorship, and, and which is very important for us you know, as designers, um, and something that is flexible and customizable. And so I'm actually quite excited about, and I think Charles Eames would be, but it's hard to speak on his behalf, about the possibilities of adapting authorship and design and creativity to individual people's, to individual needs. Has what you've just shown us have an infinite number of permutations or is there a, a finite number? It's a, it's a finite number because you do want, you know, if you, if you make five or six of these tables, they still look like they come from the same language. They still look like they come from the same author. Just like a line of, again, Eames or George Nelson tables or cabinets look like, are, are quite diverse. Mm. Um, they made lots and lots of variations of these products, but you immediately know where they came from. So you're giving the user just enough control, but in the end, the aesthetics are still within your framework. The aesthetics, the structural, the construction, all have to sort of remain within the framework. Um, you know, structural for obvious reasons. The table can only be a certain size with those structural members. Um, I, I, you know, I think it's really fascinating, and I think uh, this is... There hasn't been much innovation in the world of furniture in the last 50 years. You have to order it. It takes months to get in. You have to hope it's going to fit. You know, often you wish it was a little bit shorter, a little bit longer. It would fit better. Um, this could be a third wave. And they deliver anywhere? Um, they just launched um, in a few countries in Europe. And Eng England is, uh, the UK is, is, um, is the next launch um, uh, shortly. But they got a great reception um, here at, um, at um, London Design Week. Anything else you want to show us? Excuse me? Anything else you'd like to show? Let me see. Um, well, one uh, other notion, and we started with that, so maybe we should finish. Um, these are all projects uh, that we do in the developing world. So the idea that design is just a luxury and it just serves us the um, lucky few in the West um, is something that I have been very lucky to, to, to be a part of the transformation of that notion. And um, um, this is, these are eyeglasses in Mexico. We distribute half a million of these every year to children in Mexico. And since we're talking about color, what makes a difference here is the fact that we produce them in any color that the kids ask for. And these are kids that are getting these glasses for free. They used to get um, um, state-issued black glasses. And it was such a stigma, especially at that young age, that they wouldn't wear them. Um, and uh, we found a, a factory in, um, in Mexico, and we worked with them, as well as the uh, nonprofit, that allows the children to pick the upper and the lower part and to get these really um, uh, unique glasses. So this has been going on for six years now, several million glasses. and. Um, uh, these are pictures I took myself of, uh, of a distribution in Mexico. And the latest in our iteration of how to engage design, innovation, and entrepreneurship um, in, the, um, in the developing world is a program we called SPRING, supported by UK Aid, USAID, and uh, the, Nike, um, uh, the Nike Foundation. Um, and it's a program where Rather than coming up with solutions over here and transporting them over there, we actually sit down with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs such as uh, Charles Komodo. We have 18 entrepreneurs that we support both financially and with expertise coming from all around the world. They're local. They provide local solutions in Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And this is, this is um, so the notion that our technologies are just serving us um, is something that I think is, is laughable. If you look at M-Pesa, the payment system in Africa, um, you know, this is something that everybody can use to transfer money to each other. Here in London, three quarters of the time, taxis don't even take a credit card. So, so you know, M-Pesa, you know, payment in Africa is far beyond what we can do here. This is fantastic because this, um, in Kenya, 50% of, 50 of people have never seen a doctor not even at birth. Imagine that. And, um, but there's plenty of doctors in Kenya. They live in, in cities, and so those places are hard to reach for most. 
and um, what he provides. And, but they have also a lot of free time. These doctors want to be busy, but they have free time. And uh, patients don't show up. They're not booked all day. So they put their specialty and their name on the application. And when someone wants to, um, on the other hand, somebody wants a 15-minute consultation via voice or uh, Skype, um, they can be contacted. And this will be, this gives access to medicine, to, to, to doctor's appointments, to people all over Kenya. Um, we work on this app. Um, I mean, they're developing this app, but we're, we're supporting this particular startup. And um, changes specifically the life of girls, because for teenage girls and adolescent girls, it's very intimidating it's complicated to make appointments, get there, etc. It's intimidating to be in front of, uh, of a doctor. So they can do it via Skype. But these are the kind of technologies I would be using tomorrow. Uh, you know, the, the, and um, you know, I, think, I think the way we think technology is sometimes you know, threatening to us can actually bypass um, infrastructures that are not in place in other places and uh, really make a big difference. Well, you began by talking about the one laptop per child project. And of course, we know that the under 10s can use digital technology much better than some of us. Of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, are you ready to answer any questions? Sure. Yeah, let's take some questions. Any questions? I can't see any questions. There's a question in the front row. Hi. Um, taking note of your comment about technology needing to be discreet. Um, one of the things I've noticed over time is that um, the big brands, especially designer brands, have kept away from adopting um, sort of um, tech-friendly, tech-enabled gadgets. But increasingly, a lot of startups are coming up with these smart jewelry and things like that. Is that something that you see a lot of the designer labels, especially, also embracing? Do I see that happening from big labels? Or yeah, no, most? No. From the startups and yes. who, are, who are now making a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so startups are, 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 are very dynamic. They aren't afraid of disrupting an existing clientele because they don't have any. Um, they're, they're, you know, they live and die by the success of um, new ideas. So they're very exciting and very fun to work with as far as designers. And in fact, you're seeing more and more designers being entrepreneurs themselves. Um, this, is, this has been a, a, a tremendous change and phenomena um, to see all these entrepreneurs that are actually designers. It used to be that if you wanted to raise money for someone, if you were a designer, you had absolutely zero chance. If you talk to the founders of Airbnb, who are two industrial designers, who, by the way, were trying to get a job at Fuse Project. Um, 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 and um, I, I should have joined their thing. But um, This is the man who said no to the Beatles. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, they're, they're building um, great companies because the, the, how they use technology is not about technology. It's about the, um, you know, how beautiful, how easy... Uh, how accessible, um, really thinking about the user experience first. So, um, yeah, there's, there's jewelry and eyeglass uh, companies, and they're starting to incorporate technologies um, into their products, and I think we're going to see great things there. Um, but as all things with startups, you know, most of them are, you know, going to struggle, and a few of them are going to succeed. Anybody else over there? Uh, what was the reason why the second generation jawbone failed? What was the actual main cause? Which gen of which product? Uh, the jawbone. Um, I'm not sure. It was it was the band. I believe it, it broke. Oh. Well, we actually yes. So so when you when you make products, sometimes some products uh, have issues. So we we had a um, uh, we had a sort of a, a failure on the board with one of the components, and um, we. Um, worked and relaunched nine months later um, the, the the product 
and we've we are the third or fourth generation now with um, um, a lot of really interesting features integrated as well but yes I mean when you're a startup and you launch something uh, some things don't work the first um, the first Bluetooth headset we did um, I did with job on you've never heard of because it was on the market for about five minutes okay um, Eve thank you for a very colorful presentation Oh, there is one more oh, question. Maybe let's finish on a higher note. Oh, sorry, I just want to ask. <laughs> it better be. Okay. Um, I think the work that you've done in the developing world is really admirable. But I just want to ask if you believe technology and design has has become so good that it's made life too easy in a way. Like you showed the table just now, where you can just order a table, you can view it in your own home. I mean, doesn't that detract from the experience of going out and buying a table or going around looking at a shop? Is it? Is it become that technology for my generation, especially? It's you can go through life without actually having to talk to people in a way. Do you feel that's a thing? Well, the, the, you know, I think, as I said before, we're in the infancy of what these technologies, what they do. We're also in the infancy of how, as humans, we um, are mature or rather immature about the way technology sucks us in. And uh, and um, you know, I think I think. You know, it's only been what seven years, eight years since the the the, the first iPhone launched. Um, I think when you look back 20, 30 years from now, people will look back at our behavior. It will be a wonderful creature, uh, uh, um, caricature. Um, you know, the fact that we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, completely um, sucked in by those uh, by by physical displays. I think is laughable. That said, and, and my passion is, you know, we have, we have five senses. Some people say we have a lot more senses, but we have five senses. We have adapted over the last 10,000 years to recognize the smallest of changes, uh, a, a little bit of wind, a, a temperature change by, change by even one or two degrees. We as human beings will recognize that. And it will say something. There's a storm coming. There is a rain coming. And I believe that technology needs to send us the same type of subtle signals that allow us to react, that, that, that confirm that a certain action has been taken or give us information or, or allow us control. Um, and so it takes a lot more work to go from purely displaying numbers and pictures on a, on a, on a display than starting to communicate invisible or more intuitive types of signals. And I think in the next X years, 10, 20 years, um, we will have, technology will have, we will develop, designers and technologists will develop ways for technology to communicate with us that will be a lot less disruptive and hopefully at the same time will mature a little bit. That's a pretty high note to end on. Thank you, Eve. Thank you. Thank you.